tonight. <clears throat> Thank you all for getting on here tonight. I am excited uh, for tonight's test, not because we all love the tests, but we love the results that we get when we pass the test. Come on, somebody. And so uh, tonight, I thought I was a week behind uh, when I said the warfare test on the Zoom thing. And then I started looking. I was like, wait, the warfare test was last week. And, I, and then I couldn't find tonight's test. Tonight, we're doing the self-will test. It took me a little bit. I don't even know where I saved tonight's test, but I found it. And I'm ready to talk. I believe this is a test that, again, we're going to go through. Every person on here is going to go through it. But it may be a little different than maybe what you might think of when you hear the, the term self-will test. And so I'll jump right in. When a leader realizes <clears throat> that God is asking them to do something that counters their own plans and counters their own desires, guess what? The self-will test has begun. And so God has to break the self-will and the personal ambition of every person that he works through. He has to break that off. He has to bring us to the place of dying to those things so that he can trust us to do whatever is required of us in his kingdom. And so in order for us to come to that point, he's got to break off our self-will and our personal ambition. That doesn't mean we don't have a will and that doesn't mean we don't have ambitions, but it does mean that we've submitted and surrendered them to him. And so uh, think about this. There are going to be times when uh, God asks you, or I'll say, I like the term invite you. He invites us to lay down things and to, and to sacrifice things in our life that are good and beneficial. It's not just repenting of the sin. It's not just getting the ugliness and the attitudes and stuff out of our life. There's going to be a time where he invites us to lay down and sacrifice the good things and the beneficial things in our life. <clears throat> I remember, because if you know me, I am, I'm very structured. I like structure. And so there was a time where it's like I'm fasting every Wednesday. Every Wednesday I'm fasting. I'm fasting. And God was like, you know what? I want you to lay that down. <gasps> but God, I'm fasting. This is scriptural. I'm being a man of God. Yeah, and you're doing it because you think it's a, it became a self-serving thing and a self-righteous thing. And he, he had me lay it down. And so I laid it down. And I was happy to lay it down because I like to eat. But it, it messed with my motivation and it messed with my mindset because I was doing something good and I was doing something that I thought was pleasing to the Lord. Plus, there's going to be times where God is going to ask you to do something for him and he's not going to give you any logical reason behind it. He's just going to say, Donna, do this. Dolores, do this. And there, it doesn't even make sense. And I remember in the, when, when I read that, it made me think of Pastor Mike would tell this story of this lady at Bethany in Louisiana. I'm talking businesswoman, prim and proper, but she got hungry for the Lord. And uh, she, so she's responding to the altar call and she's there and she's digging in at the altar call. And God says, I want you to roll around on the floor. Now I'm good. He didn't ask. He didn't say it twice. He invited, I want you to roll around, roll around on the floor. Well, to most people, myself included, that would be, that would, that would take eyes off of Jesus and things like that. But uh, she swallowed her pride. She had no explanation. Didn't make sense. She rolled around on the floor. She wasn't like flailing. She's kind of, you know, I'm doing it. She rolled around on the floor and she encountered God and there was massive breakthrough. Massive breakthrough as a result. See, in not explaining his request to leaders, God is developing a childlike faith and an obedience in our hearts. And that's the kind of faith that pleases him, right? Uh, Hebrews eleven six. 6, without faith, it's impossible to please him. And a lot of times he'll ask you to do stuff that makes no sense whatsoever. He'll, he'll sometimes, God will ask you to sacrifice things that we know is God's will. He'll ask you to lay down what he said is his will. Why? Because he's God and he wants you to do that. And I think, man, 
Think about Abraham and Isaac, right? God told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. Isaac was the son of the promise. He was the manifestation of the word of God. And Mo or Moses, Abraham was loving him. Abraham was, was parenting him and all these things. And God said, you know what? I want you to sacrifice him. Go up to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him. Because see, in all of these things, our hearts, our desires, our thoughts, our feelings and our plans need to be submitted to God's will. And so that constant submission, that constant surrender to the Lord's will, that's what Christianity is all about. You've heard me say this uh, I, in the past, I'm sure, that everything in the Bible, every command, every everything comes down to surrender and obey. You know, so it makes me think of the psalm, let the, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And I always think of, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I always think of so, surrender and obey. It comes down to God, I surrender. And when you're surrendered, you'll obey. You'll do anything for him. And so a lot of times when God's inviting us to do something, we've never laid hands on the sick before. I want you to go pray for that person. Why? He's inviting you to walk by faith. He's inviting you to lay down your pride, to lay down your fear of man, to lay down that self-will and bring you to the place of total surrender and total obedience. And so when he speaks something that clashes with your desires, that clashes with your will, we as leaders and as believers, we have to quickly respond in obedience to his word, quickly respond in obedience to his action, just like Abraham did. Because, right, didn't Abraham, what did it say? I believe it's Genesis chapter 22. It says he woke up early the next morning. And I've preached on this before. Like, if God were to tell me, you know, hey, I want you to go sacrifice Judah. I want you to go up to Enchanted Rock and I want you to sacrifice Judah. Can I tell you, that's the day I'm sleeping in. That's the day I'm rebuking the devil. That's the day I'm saying, man, that can't be God. There's no way that's not consistent with his will, his word, his character, his nature. Nothing like that. Because Judah is a promised son for us. He's our accident, so to speak. He's our surprise. And I know God has something special for this young man and all of these things. And I would have mind games galore. Can you imagine Abraham waiting 25 years for the child of promise? He's made manifest. They say uh, uh, Isaac was between 13 and 16 years old. He's living in it. And God says, do it. It says, Abraham woke up early the next morning. Why? Because Abraham had already died to everything 25 years earlier, 30 years earlier, right? After he had given birth to an Ishmael, he had died to it. And doesn't Hebrew say that he didn't weaken in his faith? As a matter of fact, his faith grew stronger. So he knew God could even raise Isaac from the dead. That's surrender and that's obedience. That's the self-will test. The purpose of it, the self-will test subjects our will to God's word. Both the written word as well as the quickened word, the spoken word, the prophetic word. And so it brings us into proper alignment. And so in doing this, God helps fulfill the scriptural instruction that Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.31, let him, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. It brings us into alignment where, you know what? It's not me. Only God gets the glory. That's why God uses, again, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 31, he uses the foolish. He uses the weak. He uses the despised. He uses the unexpected things, the unexpected people of this world for his kingdom. Why? So that he's going to receive all the glory and he gets all the credit because, you know, if he were to use, he, if he were to use the best of the best, the smartest, the richest, the this and the that and the other, guess what? They would want to take credit. But then he uses people like Doug Walker, who's just nothing special about this guy, you know, and he'll use the us's. And that doesn't mean if they're rich or if they're smart or whatever, God doesn't use those people. But primarily he uses the B team. Why? So he gets all the glory. So he gets all of the credit. But our sin nature pits uh, our, our natural will against God's will. In the self-will test, you'll see what's in your sin nature. You'll see what your natural will is when God invites you to crucify something in your life, when he invites you to lay something 
down. But God has to bring us to the point of crucifying our desires, crucifying our dreams so that he can accomplish his desires in his way. That's the key. Because he'll place a dream inside of us and we'll have a picture of what it's going to look like. And we think it's going to go from point A to point B. And we all know we've been in this thing long enough. Point A to point B is not a, is not a B line. It's filled with all sort of this, that, and whatever. Why? Because he's wanting to bring us to a place of total surrender and obedience. He wants to, us to be able to fulfill his will in his way. And so I know... I had, God had placed in me in August of 1989, a dream and a desire to be in full-time ministry, to be a youth pastor. And so I gave myself to that. I knew it was God's will. I had his word. I stood on it. I rearranged my entire life to give myself to the word of God, to give myself to what he had spoken to me very clearly. But here it was several years later, you know, I, I served under four, wait, five youth pastors in four years, four, four youth pastors in five years. Man, I'm doing jobs. And at this point, I'm a portable toilet cleaner. A lot of y'all know my story and I'm going about and, and it didn't seem like I was any closer to coming into what God had spoken to me all those years earlier. You know, it's 1995, it's 1996. He spoke to me in 89 and I've been faithful and I've been going at it and I had prayed. Uh, you know, that I, that I would just die to it. I crucify this desire, God. I lay it down. I give it to you. I place it into your hands. All, I can't tell you how many times I prayed that prayer. If it was a dozen times, it was a hundred times. God, I give it to you. God, I place it in your hands. God, I surrender. I crucify it all. I lay it down, whatever it looks like, everything. But then one particular Thursday afternoon, I'll never forget. I could probably take you where I was on the road. One particular Thursday afternoon, I finally and truly laid it down. I don't know what it was, but all I know is when I prayed that prayer that I had prayed dozens and dozens and dozens, dozens of times before, it was done. It was like it went from here to here. Y'all know that drop. You know when you're trying to convince yourself by faith, and I'm doing it by faith, and all of a sudden, you're speaking and declaring by faith. It's there. It's settled. It's done. And that's what happened. I settled it in my heart. And if everything was going to look different, you know, and I was going to have to still work this job. I was going to be the best employee I knew how to be, and I was going to be the best minister I knew how to be. It's not what I wanted. I wanted to be in full-time ministry, but if this is what it's going to look like, then this is how it is. And so uh, I shifted my attitude in a massive way when I surrendered. Actually, the surrender shifted my attitude, and I just committed. All right, I'm going to be the best whatever. God, if this is what it looks like, I surrender all. And so my will had been broken that day. I finally gave up. My will had been broken, but my spirit wasn't broken. And see, that's what good parents do. They break the will of their child without breaking the spirit, right? And so we're going to break that will that wants to dig in, you know? Like there was a time where uh, I used to, we used to just paddle our kids, pat, 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 three times. And like Josh would be undone, but Allie would dig in. I know y'all can't imagine, but Ali would dig in and like, like this. And it got to a point where we are paddling this girl incessantly. And, and some of y'all, you have heard this story. And I went in and I'm crying to Pastor Mike's wife and Pastor Gary's wife, Miss Jeannie and Miss Sammy. And I'm like, and then I have anointed everything we know to anoint with oil. We paddle her nonstop. We've cast devil, you know, just whatever we had to do. And we're like, I'm losing my mind on my daughter. From birth to two and a half, she was perfect. From two and a half to four and a half, she might have been demon possessed. I'm not sure. I don't think so. But she was, I'll just say, very strong-willed in, in, in the terms of uh, Dr. James Dobson. My daughter was strong-willed. Oh, wait, she continues to be strong-willed. Anyway, and I'll still paddle her. I don't care. And honey, if you're watching it, you know it's true. I love you. Anyway, but uh, they talked to me about this very same thing. You know, they said, you have to break her will. And so if you just go pat, 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 and she's digging in, you have to go until there's that breaking in the cry. And so we would do it. And for Josh, you could do it once. He's undone. 
<laughs> broken. Allie, there were times where like, and I mean, it would kill me. Like I'm crying like six, seven, eight times before she broke. And the way we didn't break her, break her spirit was we would love on her. We'd speak into her. We'd pray with her. We'd let her know that, you know, this is who you are. This isn't who you are and all these things. But, oh, my gosh. But this is what I knew. My kid is not going to have more will than me. Right? I'm the parent. And so, just like a good parent, God has to break our will, not our spirit. And so, in the self-will test, he's bringing us to the place of breaking our will not our spirit. Does that make sense? Y'all with me in that? Because I believe a lot of us, we've been there. We have desires. We have godly things, things that he's put in us. And God, you're asking me to lay it down? Yeah. Or God, you want me to do this? I've never done that before. You want me to witness to somebody? I can't do that because if I do that on my job, I'm going to get fired and on and on and on. I'll wait. And he'll just do it. And he's wanting to bring us to the place of total surrender and total obedience. Who's the biblical illustration? You're in great company if you're in the self-will test. It's Jesus. You know, uh, the famous passage that I'm about to read in Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 to 46. Uh, it's where we find, it's in the Garden of Gethsemane where it's Jesus' final submission to the Father's will before he went to the cross. And it demonstrated the, the kind of submission, you know, in the laying down of his own personal self-will, right? This is one reason why I want to go to Israel so bad with Pastor Greg. Because one, the, the, maybe the number one place, yeah, I want to go to Golgotha. I want to go, you know, the place where Jesus was crucified. But the place that, that I envision, I want to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. I want to go to the place where Jesus prayed. Uh, and, and he sweat great, great drops of blood. I want to see that place where he died to himself, literally. You know, just kind of, I lay it all down. Listen to this. Listen to the self-will uh, test being overcome and won. If we want to win this test, listen to Jesus. It says, then Jesus came with them to a place uh, called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and I pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further. Man, there's so much to preach, but I'm going to go on. He went a little further and fell down on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. I know you've heard this, but listen to it in, within the context of the, uh, the self-will test. Verse 40 says, Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup can pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed a third time, saying the same words that he had previously. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. It was settled. Jesus' will was broken, but his spirit wasn't. Did you see that? Because he said he was, he was extremely sorrowful to the point of death when he went in, right? When he went a little further. When he came back. Hey, let's get up. Let's get going. It's time. It's game time. And so his, 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 uh, his human self didn't want to experience the suffering of the cross, right? His divine nature desired the cross. His, his, his divine nature wanted to do the will of the Father. That's where not my will, your will be done came from. But that wasn't his natural you know, nature. That wasn't the case in his human nature. See, every leader in God's kingdom has to lay down their plans, has to lay down their desires in order to fulfill God's will, no matter what the cost is, 
no matter how bad it hurts, just like Jesus did. And only as we lay down our fleshly desires and only as we lay down our carnal ambitions, but not only that, even the dreams and the desires and the visions that God has placed in our hearts, when we lay that stuff down, can God use us as a vessel for his glory? And that's where we all want to get to. That's why you're on this call. You want to be a vessel for his glory. You don't want to be a vessel for your glory. It's not about us. We want to see God move in supernatural ways in and through our lives. Because at the end of the day, it's not about us. It's not about us getting the glory. It's not about us laying hands on the sick. It's not about us moving in signs, wonders, and miracles. It's not about Legacy Church being a revival center for Hayes County in this region. It is about being vessels for the glory of God. And so in everything, we have to lay it down. We have to lay down our desire in all of it. And so let us make not my will, but your, your will be done, our continual prayer and our continual attitude. Amen. That's, that's the surrender of everything. God, I give it to you. God, it's yours. I don't like it. God, I thought you said this, but I'll lay it down. God, I don't understand, but I lay it down. God, this makes no sense. Matter of fact, it sounds demonic right? But I lay it down because God, I want to only surrender and I only want to obey you because I have no doubt that'll go a long way towards helping us not only pass the self-will test, but empower us to do God's will in greater ways. Hey, hey, in a leveling up sort of way than we've previously seen individually and as a church. You want to level up in these things? You want to level up in operating in the gifts of the Spirit? You want to level up in your ministry? Then it comes to, it really comes down to God, not my will, your will be done. And man, that can be a battle. That can be a clash in the biggest of ways. And so I want to pray for us. And then I have uh, some action steps with this Father in Jesus' name. God, this isn't a fun test. None of these tests are fun. At the same time, God, our heart's desire, and I'm praying on your behalf, so make this your prayer as I pray aloud. Um, but God, we want to come to the place where we're in complete and utter, total surrender and radical obedience to you. God, in those times where you're asking us to do something and it doesn't make sense. God, those times where, where our, our, our natural sin nature and our divine nature seem to be clashing God, I pray that the, that the divine nature always wins, that we would learn to walk in the Spirit. We, you would bring us to a place of complete, utter, and total self-reliance. I mean, God-reliance, God. And, and we wouldn't rely on self. We would rely totally on you, God. Bring us to the place of total surrender. Bring us to the place, grace us to die to ourself. Grace us to die to our dreams. Grace us to crucify, not just our flesh, flesh and our sin nature, God, but to crucify every dream and every desire we have. Because I pray, God, that our life would be about you, period. Because we know we're storing up for ourselves treasures in heaven, not treasures on earth, God. So we give it all to you. We lay it down. Bring us into alignment with your will. Bring us into alignment, into oneness with you, my Father. Grace us to pass this test every time. Because we know it's not a one and done. We know it's a continual thing. Father, I pray that you would grace us in it. Empower us to walk this out, God, even when it hurts, even when it doesn't make sense to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, somebody. And so let me get to um, this. There's three action steps that I want us to take. And I'm not going to try to play it because stuff is in the way. Actually, maybe I can. Um, first thing is, is over the next couple of days, even, you know what, even tonight, identify an area, a desire, a dream, or an ambition that maybe as I was talking the, the Lord kind of put his finger on, he kind of highlighted something in you, like you were like, oh yeah, and you know what it is. Not maybe no in your head, but you know that you maybe need to die to or surrender to. That doesn't mean he won't resurrect it, right? But unless a seed goes in the ground and dies, it remains alone. And so, um, but if you die to it, that way it can multiply. Uh, the second thing is commit to making not my will, but yours be done your prayer and your continual declaration. Absolutely. 
Make that your prayer. Be intentional about it. God, I surrender all. Maybe even think about, you know, uh, surrender and obey. God, I surrender all. I obey. I want to I wanna make my life about radical obedience to you to where there's nothing you wouldn't do for it, right? I'm looking at everybody who's on this call. I know that your desire. Last thing is choose to trust God's will and his ways as being far superior to yours. Even when he says, you know what? I want you to sacrifice your Isaac. Okay. I want you to lay that down. Okay. I want you to roll across the front. You better hear from God. Don't just do it because, Pastor Doug, you heard that story. I'm going to roll across because that's my good luck charm. No. It's, God, I lay this down. God, I surrender it to you in Jesus' name. And so, ah, yes. There we go. Come on, help me. Aha. There we go. Ta-da. There we go. That is the self-will test. And that is one that I believe in many areas we're in constantly. Will you lay it down? Will you surrender all? And when you, will you stay there? And then when he invites you into the testing portion, not just the day in and day out surrender, I want to encourage us, let's pass the test. But then also, especially those of us on the line, uh, since you've heard this and you're going through it, talk to somebody about it when you're going through it. And man, let's walk with each other out. That's being family right? And that's healthy. So that's all I've got. And so 